let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to coast, This Week in America. The Greatest Gift by Richard Duffy tells the story of how a family is held together by the bonds of marriage, how war influences their bonds, and the concerns they have while caring for each other. Richard was born on June 5, 1937, a retired science teacher with a bachelor's degree and a master's in structural geology. Richard attended a one-room country schoolhouse for the first six years of his education. He owned a 100-acre farm where he lived for most of his life, enjoying hunting and fishing, which occupied most of his time. And Richard Duffy, author of The Greatest Gift, is our guest on This Week in America. Richard, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Well, thank you so very much. It's a pleasure talking to you, sir, and all the folks that are eventually going to hear this. Uh, I hope my message, you know, is going to benefit a lot of people out there. I, I think it will. Thank you again. It is our pleasure to have you with us. And let's start with the the inspiration for the book. The book is The Greatest Gift. Richard Duff, the author, our guest. Richard, what was the inspiration for the book? I think uh, it was a combination of many things. I think from the time I can barely remember World War II and, of course, up through the Vietnam era, I was, you know, uh, a much younger man, and I was pretty much up on things. And I, I think uh, one of my experiences as, as a very young child uh, in 1944 and 1945, I was like seven and eight years old. I lived in the country, and I lived on top of a ridge in a small community. Across the valley on the other ridge was a graveyard. And in the summertime, when I would be outside playing maybe with some of the rest of the kids on adjoining farms, every once in a while, and this really stuck with me, <clears throat> excuse me, I would hear gunfire, rifles, and it wasn't hunting season. It was coming from the graveyard, and eventually we found out through our parents and so forth that they were burying a soldier whose body had been shipped back from the front in World War II. They had a salute when the, in the military service when they buried somebody, and that really stuck with me. And I tried to incorporate that into the book when my two main characters, Jonathan and Martha, lost their son John uh, on the invasion uh, in June 6, 44 at Omaha Beach. And that was one of my earliest memories. And then later on in life, uh, I was always like a country-oriented person, very familiar with nature, I became really interested in science. And when I went to college, that's what I chose as my major. Uh, it wasn't life science. It was basically uh, earth science, meteorology, astronomy, geology. Main emphasis was on geology. And uh, one of the summers after I finished my Bachelor of Science work at Indiana in here in Pennsylvania, I attended three other colleges, Geneva, Slippery Rock, and Allegheny College in Meadville, Pennsylvania. And just by pure luck, I mean, you talk about a coincidence. One morning we were in the lab working, examining some rock samples, and a call came into the college they put it through to the lab professor, and after he was done talking, he looked at us and he said, boy, did we get lucky. A backhoe operator draining part of a swamp for a housing development, in his hoe when he lifted it up, there was a white post. Now, another coincidence, this same operator, two months before that, had discovered a mastodon. Okay, so he didn't know what wow. maybe this was, this tusk. 
So we went out the next morning, and the professor in charge of our little field operation, he said, Rich, jump down in all that mud. The mud was two feet deep. <laughs> Put your heads on the skull of this animal. Run it on your hands down along the side of the skull and check its dentition, teeth. Okay, so I started. I was clear up to my shoulders and neck in mud, and I ran my head hands down, and I ran it along the tooth line. I got a big smile on my face. They were small dentitions. Mastodons have great big dentition. I looked up at the Professor, and he must have jumped six feet in the air. <laughs> he was so happy. And you realize then what that made me. The first Pens Pennsylvania person, scientist, whatever you want, might want to call me, to ever excavate and discover a woolly mammoth, which now this day is on exhibition in the uh, hall in Allegheny College in Meadville. They built a chamber to keep the humidity up. The bones were not in great condition, but they determined that this woolly mammoth that I personally lifted out of the hole and identified was a young male, probably went through the ice when he was very young in the spring or fall, couldn't escape, and he died there. And that type of thing right there just anchored me, you know, in my science pursuit of finishing my master's in structural geology. Now, I think I need to explain the term structural geology. Yes, please. If, if it's okay. Yes, please. Uh, basically, it's a study in geology of the forces that shape and determine the Earth's surface and subsurface. Uh, it, it's everything from volcanic activity to earthquakes, glaciers, running water, and so forth. And that set the pattern for me for my rest of my teaching career. And the, the farm that I lived on, I think, was probably a major factor in choosing the setting for my book. And in my mother's family, uh, there are many people who bear the name Jonathan and Martha. My middle name is John, shortened for Jonathan. One of my sons carries that name. And so on my mother's side of the family, they were all coal miners and farmers. My dad had, his side had a very, very small family. They had immigrated from Ireland uh, about uh, three generations ago. So the farm life, you know, I think led me to see uh, what there was to the life of being closer to animals, closer to really nice people on the adjoining farms. They all belong to a, a little community, uh, I guess you could call it organization called the Grange. And they basically, uh, you know, were together because they were the patrons of husbandry which simply means the taking care of animals. Ah. And the farm life, I think, uh, in my book, reflects that a little bit in how good it is and how generous these people are, especially in my book when John loses his life and his pregnant girlfriend back here, they were going to marry when he got out, uh, she was accepted into the family lived with them. She bore a son who was named John, and it was just like a miracle had come to Jonathan and Martha. This was a reincarnation like of their son, one of the greatest gifts. That's where I got my name for the book. And I think the thread of religion and uh, the community type of life just put that book together. I wrote that book on three different Sunday afternoons wow. two years ago. <laughs> and the words just kept flowing. I did not have to think about what I was going to write next. I would write a chapter, take a coffee break, come back, write the next one, and so forth. And in many places, uh, you can't help but overlook when you read the book that religion is always kind of the foundation of the people, the thing that 
holds them together and the, the kind of community, you know, that they lived in. And in the very end, I think uh, Jonathan and Martha received their reward in heaven. And as in, I think, the very last sentence, when John and his wife are walking back from Jonathan's funeral, uh, they can hear the choir. I don't know if you're familiar with my book, but that's like the um, ending sentence. Yes. They, the, you know, the sun is shining through the trees, and they stop and they look back toward the church with their twins, which they bore uh, later after they were married there. And it's, it was such a fitting closing to my book. And it, it just came to me, you know, I'm a religious person. I took steps to make sure that I did not, that I did not, sir, mention any particular religion. I want the people that read my book to take it as it comes to them. Yes. They can interpret, you know, in their own way. Uh, you know, I don't care whether it's, you know, uh, Mormon, whether it's Jewish, Baptist, Methodist, or whatever, yes. that's not the point. It's the term religion that counts here, and its ability, its ability to give people the binding force to see life as it should be, the good life. Well, we and see that. I don't think I've missed anything. Sorry, maybe if I was long-winded there, sir, but no. That, is where it came from. Okay. Well, I love the story that you tell and how it's all tied together. And you paint such a, a lovely picture of what, what life was like then. The cover of the book sort of sets the tone. The book is The Greatest Gift. The author is Richard Duffy, our guest on the program. Book available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You'll find it at uh, youarelinkpublishing.com, the publisher of the book. And all this, of course, on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. You mentioned the story sort of sort of came to you. You did over a period of several Sundays. What's your future as an author? You're a very gifted writer. Are you thinking about another book? I'm glad you posed that question because I have in the back of my mind a story that basically centers around my wife. She was born a stone's throw, literally, from Omaha Beach. And she can recall vividly when the Allies walked through her little village and all the people were so happy. In Western Europe, everybody was on their radios every night waiting for the great invasion. And uh, on the British broadcasting system, BBC, the key words to go out to the population that the invasion was on was, because every night there was a lot of things going out there, was the ducks are on the pond. Eisenhower used that to tell people that now his armada was sailing toward Omaha and Utah. The English people, they were involved in sword and uh, gold. And the Canadian people were Juno. There was three allied thrust. These were the allies with small minute representations from other Western Europe countries. And she recalls vividly the allies marching through her village, you know, toward Germany. Yes. And the people just came out of their houses all over the town and they gave the soldiers baked goods and bottles of wine and cheese. And it was just like this tremendous relief of the people that had been waiting for years because France had literally been dominated by, you know, the Nazis for several years. And my wife's father served in the French resistance. And he tells stories in the middle of the night, the Gestapo would come knocking on the door and he went to the outside and they questioned him and beat the hell out of him. Then when nothing was happening about dark, he would go to the first little aerodrome they called an airport and they would give him homemade little bombs and he and a pilot would fly up like a Snoopy plane, you know, in a oh, cartoon. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and he would fly over the German lines real quick and he would throw these bombs down and then they would get back because they carried no armament. And I mean, those stories and then her and her family hiding under the 
kitchen table when the air raid si- uh, siren went off. I mean, I think there's a book there. But oh, yes. what I'm not sure of, sir, is there's probably a lot of books that have been written about D-Day. And I just don't know, but I would like to get something more on the personal side of somebody that lived right at Omaha Beach. That's that's what I'm working on in my mind here. And every once in a while, she'll tell me other things. So if and when this book happens, she will probably be my chief consultant. So there's something stirring here. I can't give you a time frame, but I can tell you this. I'm going to try to make it as personal as possible because uh, before I sat down and wrote my book, The Greatest Gift, uh, every night on TV, there's a ton of political books. There's the romantic, there's the westerns, there's the murder mysteries. I think they dominate the market. And I think my book just might be an exception. And I think I have a, a, a message there that just can't be overlooked. Because as I say in my book, uh, you've got to be a better person after you read my book. You, it's going to help you. Some people that I've handed out some of my uh, copies that they've sent me, I've read it a couple of times. Then they give it to their family uh, yes. and they are impressed. So yes, there's something stirring and answering your question in a second book, but I can't give you a time frame. but uh, it won't be a lot of months or years. It probably would be before this year is out. And I'm going to try to make it, you know, very personal because I have a witness that was on the scene, yes. D-Day, and what followed in the weeks and months. What so, an amazing yeah, inspiration. For, yes, what an uh, inspiration for that book. And as you're talking about it, you have this ability to make these people come alive and the situation come alive. As you're describing that, I can visually uh, see what you're doing. And in the book, The Greatest Gift, you do that. You take something that happened decades ago. You make it relevant today by telling the stories of the people. We can all relate to the people the emotions that they go through with the war, with the loss of loved ones, and the sense of family, the sense of coming together. Richard brings it all to life in his book, The Greatest Gift. Book at Amazon, you are linked publishing, uh, Barnes & Noble, all of the usual places. Uh, Richard, i got a minute or so left in the program. What do you hope the, the, the reader takes away from this? You mentioned making him a better person. It makes us think about who we are as, as people, doesn't it? That's probably, uh, you know, the bottom line here. That's probably the number one question. Uh, I would hope that regardless of their social status, uh, mental situation, financial status, whatever it is in life, I hope it makes them take a broader look of life, accept things for what they are, don't jump to conclusions, rumors, and innuendos. Kind, try to be objective. Try to sit and listen and understand people. One of my uh, famous sayings is, before you become a, a great speaker and advice giver, you first must become a good listener. You must develop understanding. And I hope when the people are done reading this book, they mentally analyze my written word, because one of the ancient sayings I come across in my chronicles and so forth that I read is, you know, the spoken word uh, is temporary, but the written word lasts forever. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Oh, but yes. Boy, that, that really hits it. But uh, yes, they should become a better person. I think that's in the book in a couple of places. Lord, I hope so. And you know what? I advise reading it a second time. Try to mentally analyze what you have just read and how you can connect with it. And, you know, that's what I hope they take away from it, sir. Well, that's so well said, and you do an excellent job of fulfilling that in the book, The Greatest Gift. I mentioned uh, Richard was a, uh, is a now a retired science teacher. You can sense that he... 
he really was excellent in the classroom with the way of of caring for people the way of explaining things all those characteristics come to the forefront in the book the greatest gift by richard duffy hopefully working on that follow-up with his wife's assistance we'd love to have him back to what to talk about that Richard, it's been a pleasure. Congratulations on the excellent job in the book, The Greatest Gift. Thank you for being with us on the program. Thank you very much. Believe me, it's been my pleasure, sir. And I wish you all the best and God bless you and the people that listen to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you with us, and hopefully we can continue this conversation with the next book. Our guest has been Richard Duffy. The book is The Greatest Gift. You'll find it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, UR Link Publishing Company, and uh, many other places. Go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and you can get all the information, link on to Richard's page on Amazon. Order the book there as well. You're listening to This Week in America, and we're back on today's program. After these messages, This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bechet, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again, thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.